Saddened as many of us were by last week's decision, the upside, which has been illuminated by the comments today, is that it may actually provide the opportunity, maybe not tomorrow, but at some point, for a law that actually works better in terms of protecting the right to vote. Uh, and so in terms of responses to Shelby County, it seems to me there are three big possibilities that have been suggested. One is revamping the coverage formula, rewriting section four. This, I have to say, strikes me as a non-starter. Uh, politically very difficult for the reasons that Heather earlier identified. And even if you were to get it, um, I, I am not at all confident that it would survive Supreme Court review. The second possibility um, is this disclosure slash voter impact statement idea, which uh, strikes me as very promising and seems to me squarely within Congress's power under the Elections Clause, as interpreted in the Arizona case, at least insofar as it is applied to practices that are used in federal elections. Um, I would suggest, Germaine, to this discussion that we've been having about you know, race conscious and race neutral remedies, that that ought to include but should not be limited to information about the anticipated impact of the voting practice on uh, different racial and ethnic groups. The third possibility, and this is the one I'd, I'd really like to explore, is one Rick mentioned a while back uh, and is the subject of Travis's um, um, article that I, I really think warrants some further exploration, and that is amendments of Section 3, the so-called pocket trigger. Um, Rick, you, you mentioned, and, and Travis, you say this in, in your piece as well, that it requires intentional discrimination, although the statute actually doesn't say that. It says a violation of the 14th No, or 15th. no, I don't think that's right, Travis. I thought, doesn't the statute say intentional discrimination in violation of the 14th and 15th Amendments? That's what I remember. Oh, it does. I take that back. Yeah, okay. but, but, but it's not a completely, what I was going to say is it's actually not a crazy reading, even though that's not the text set, what the text of the statute says, because if you are brought into coverage under Section 3, then the standard that's applied to you is effectively the same as under Section 5, that it, ha it not have the effect uh, or purpose of denying or abridging the vote on account of race. And so it would be odd to subject jurisdictions to a race based standard when they haven't been found ha to in have engaged in intentional race discrimination. So I guess I, I do agree that it would be helpful to clarify the statute, but then that leaves the question, so if, if jurisdictions can be brought in based not just on race discrimination, but based on other violations of the right to vote, what would then be the standard for preclearance? It shouldn't just be that it not have the purpose or effect of denying or abridging the vote on account of race. Uh, so I, I'm, I mean, I, I, I like the idea, but I'm, I'm and but I, I just wonder. I guess I'll direct this to you, Rick. What, what do you think the standard for preclearance should be for jurisdictions that are brought in based on something other than race discrimination? So that's a great question, and I hadn't thought it through uh, in advance. But but what I certainly what I want to say uh, as a as an initial response is to link this to the kind of protection for the right to vote as such that I was talking about uh, outside of the section four model. So uh, I would say, as a starting point, uh, the preclearance uh, would uh, be designed to ensure that the courts would subject further changes with respect to voting practices in that jurisdiction or the type of practices that had been found in violation to uh, 
the kind of scrutiny we were talking about, that, that they have to be necessary to serve a legitimate state purpose, maybe necessary to serve a legitimate and substantial state purpose, but a standard along those lines. And I think that's a, a great point, that if one imagines including violations of universal laws like uh, the National Motor Voter Act, then you would need to think about a substantive preclearance standard that would fit that. I think that's a good point. Ned, on this point, you know, real quick. Press it again. All right, good. Sorry. Um, that, uh, that the stand, the Ohio, the Sixth Circuit in the Ohio early voting case, in effect, used a kind of retrogression standard that it imported from uh, constitutional law, but that could be built into statute. So to, to answer Dan's question or to build on Dan's point, it seems to me that you could, you could have a retrogression standard linked to Anderson, Burdick, Crawford type claims, not just that's broader than retrogression linked to, to race-based claims, and that that could be made a statutory standard, not vulnerable to uh, different constitutional t interpretation in other circuits that might disagree with the Sixth Circuit point. So I think there is room for legislative innovation along the lines that Rick and Dan are talking about.